Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Rohan Khanelwal, your surgery faculty, and this is the discussion for quiz number two, which was on hepatobiliary system and pancreas. The discussion video for quiz number one is already there on my YouTube channel. So let's start with the first question. The first question was that a patient presented with a casualty with abdominal pain and vomiting. The CT scan image was shown. What is the provisional diagnosis? So if you see the CT image in this patient, you will see in this patient that this patient here has a stone in the gallbladder, right? Now this stone in the gallbladder, you know that majority of the gallstones, they are not radiopaque. But 10% gallstones can be radiopaque and these radiopaque gallstones can give a Mercedes-Benz sign. Especially if it's a triradiate stone, then it can give rise to a Mercedes-Benz sign as you can see. If it is a biradiate stone, it will give rise to a seagull sign, which has also been asked previously in the exam. Right, so this is a case of gallstones where this is a radiopaque gallstone and you see the Mercedes-Benz sign in this case. Now, normally gallstones can be pure cholesterol stones which are rare, they are usually solitary. Mixed stones are the most common overall and pigment stones are the ones which are most common in Asia. Now, pigment stones are ones which have less than 30% cholesterol and these can be of two types. You can either have a black pigment stone or a brown pigment stone. Now, a black pigment stone will form when there is hemolysis, when there are hemolytic disorders and this is usually insoluble bilirubin pigment polymer along with calcium phosphate and calcium bicarbonate. Right? This can be seen in hemolytic conditions like sickle cell anemia, hereditary spherocytosis. Brown pigment stones are seen in infected bile which can be due to clonorchis or with cholangitis and this is a combination of calcium bilirubinate with palmitate and stearate as well. The second question, a patient is referred with variceal bleed which is not responding to medical management. Which of the following is a contraindication to the required management? Now, this patient has variceal bleed. We know variceal bleeds are seen in portal hypertension, right? So, when there is portal hypertension, patient can develop esophageal varices and there can be upper GI hemorrhage. In these patients, we first try medical management. We try banding and sclerotherapy with endoscopic management. And if two trials of endoscopic management also fail, then we have to carry out some other intervention. And what is that some other intervention? We need to decrease the portal pressure. And to decrease the portal pressure, we need to carry out a shunt. And the shunt which we usually carry out in such a situation is called TIPS. TIPS stands for Transjugular Intrahepatic Portosystemic Shunt. So basically what we are doing is we are putting a shunt between a branch of the portal vein and a hepatic vein so that the excess portal pressure can be shunted into the systemic vein. Now, TIPS is a type of a non-selective shunt. Non-selective shunt means that here we are selecting a, we are shunting a branch of the portal vein. Here the portal vein has already joined. So, it is getting blood from the spleen and from the bowel as well. Right? And the blood which is coming from the bowel has toxins in it. So, now this toxin-rich blood is being shunted into the systemic circulation, which is why the early complication is rupture of the capsule and that can give rise to bleeding. These patients can even develop encephalopathy because of the toxins which are being shunted into the systemic circulation. But the most common late complication is blockade of the shunt. The shunt can get blocked. And if the shunt gets blocked, what is going to happen? The pressure again will increase and that will give rise to re-bleeding. Now, the question they are asking here is that when will this be contraindicated? So, this is contraindicated when there is a complete portal vein occlusion. Now, if there is a portal vein occlusion, what will you shunt? So, earlier, complete portal vein occlusion was considered as a contraindication. 
although there are a few studies which say that now it can be done but for your level you should know that a portal vein occlusion is a contraindication for tips and tips is a non selective shunt this is the third question which has been asked quite a few times in the exam in this question they are asking in the given gallbladder what is the condition which you can see and you can see that this gallbladder has been dissected it has been cut open and you can see these yellow specks in the wall of the gallbladder this is a classical sign of cholesterosis which is also known as strawberry gallbladder right and this cholesterosis or strawberry gallbladder is when there is deposition of cholesterol crystals in the wall of the gallbladder and i want you to know that cholesterosis or strawberry gallbladder does not increase the risk right does not increase the risk of gallbladder cancer this i want you to remember now you know that if there are gallstones the investigation of choice for gallstones is an ultrasound and ultrasound abdomen will show a stone in the lumen and it will show a post acoustic shadow means it will show a blackish shadow post that stone if you compare it with a polyp in the gallbladder this these are polyps in the gallbladder and i've shared in my video that i also have polyps and these are small polyps which i just keep on monitoring but polyps are not going to show a post acoustic shadow and that is how we differentiate a stone from a polyp on ultrasound this is a gross image of a gallbladder polyp and you should know that gallbladder polyps if they are more than 10 1 cm or 10 mm then they are more likely to get converted into malignancy and if they are more than 10 mm or 1 cm then you should carry out a cholecystectomy in such a patient this is the next question a patient already diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease so they've given a hint here the patient has inflammatory bowel disease comes with recurrent fever pruritus and chills mr cp image is shown here right so this is classical of multiple strictures in the biliary tree and these multiple strictures or the this beaded kind of an appearance right you can see in primary sclerosing cholangitis which can be associated with inflammatory bowel disease and this primary sclerosing cholangitis increases the risk of cholangiocarcinoma cholangiocarcinoma is carcinoma of the biliary tree now you should also know that primary sclerosing cholangitis is one of the extra intestinal manifestations which does not resolve after surgery so there are two extra intestinal manifestations in inflammatory bowel disease which don't resolve after surgery one of them is primary sclerosing cholangitis and the other one is ankylosing spondylitis oriental cholangiohepatitis is seen due to clonorchis infection right and carolis disease is a type 5 cholidocal cyst where there is dilatation of the intrahepatic portion of the biliary tree that is known as carolis disease and that has also been asked in the exam now you should also know in these patients that this primary sclerosing cholangitis can give rise to cholangiocarcinomas and that also we will pick up by mrcp this image is of mrcp which is magnetic resonance cholangiopancreaticography and later on in this discussion i will cover with you what are the indications of mrcp and ercp the next patient is a diabetic patient who comes with these lesions the patient has these typical rashes she has a drug history of ssri intake she has also had multiple episodes of deep vein thrombosis what is the most probable diagnosis so this case is a classical finding of a glucagonoma in glucagonoma you can get a necrolytic migratory rash right you can get diabetes 
right diabetes dermatitis which is a necrolytic migratory rash which you can see there can be deep vein thrombosis or migratory thrombophlebitis and there can be depression which is why the patient was on SSRIs and these four signs are classical of a glucagonoma insulinoma you know is the most common pancreatic endocrine neoplasm and this is going to come with Whipple's triad. Whipple's triad we've already discussed. There is fasting hypoglycemia, blood sugar is less than 40 and there's rapid re resolution on giving glucose. But these patients will also have a high fasting insulin level, right? Normally in all of us, if we are fasting, insulin levels will be low. When will insulin rise in the body? When we are eating something, when there's sugar in the body. But normally in fasting, insulin levels are low. But in these patients of insulinoma, the fasting insulin levels will be high. VIPoma comes with WDHA syndrome or Werner Morrison syndrome. This is watery diarrhea, hypokalemia and achlorhydria. This also has been asked in the exam. And from gastrinoma, what has been asked is the gastrinoma triangle. This gastrinoma triangle is also known as the Passero's triangle and majority of the gastrinomas, almost 65 to 70 percent of the gastrinomas arise from within this triangle. This is a simple question. A patient presented with epigastric pain. There is history of alcoholic binge followed by acute abdominal pain few weeks ago. So they are saying that there was a binge drinking, then abdominal pain few weeks ago. Now the patient has come with a mass in the epigastrium and the CT is shown below. This all of you know is the classical finding of a pseudocyst. Pseudocyst most commonly is seen in the lesser sac. Now you know lesser sac is the space behind the stomach. So this is the stomach space behind the stomach but in front of the pancreas, that is the lesser sac and the most common site for a pseudocyst or a false cyst to form post pancreatitis. So this is a pancreatic pseudocyst which is there and you know in pseudocyst that there is a D. agedios classification. This D. agedios classification is that type 1 type of cysts are seen in acute pancreatitis and usually they don't communicate with the duct main pancreatic duct type 2 can be seen in acute or chronic and they can communicating communicate with the duct and type 3 is usually seen in chronic pancreatitis and there is invariably a communication with the main pancreatic duct now all pseudocysts don't require management in fact majority of the pseudocysts will resolve spontaneously only those which are more than six centimeters in size more than six weeks old or the wall thickness is more than 6 millimeters, only those pseudocysts require intervention. This was asked once in the INICT exam. You have a 42-year-old patient who came with recurrent abdominal pain and weight loss. Serology showed raised IgG4 levels and the MRI revealed some abnormality. You can see here the pancreas on CT is bulky. It is inflamed. So, inflammation of the pancreas is known as pancreatitis. But what kind of pancreatitis is this? This is autoimmune pancreatitis, right? Autoimmune pancreatitis. You will have jaundice, weight loss, and you will get a sausage-like appearance of the pancreas, which I've shown you here. Now, chronic pancreatitis, there are various causes which you can remember as the mnemonic TIGAR-O. Now, within this TIGAR-O, G stands for genetic or hereditary. And these are two genes which I want to mention to you because they've also been asked in the INICT exam. You have the SPINK1 gene which is seen in tropical calcific pancreatitis where you have the PRSS1 gene which is seen in hereditary pancreatitis. Right, I've already told you that IgG4 can be raised in autoimmune pancreatitis. Now, this question is, um, you need to read it carefully because if you don't read it carefully, you can go wrong. A patient suffering from cirrhosis, right? So, they've given a hint that the patient is suffering from cirrhosis. 
is ready to undergo surgery for perforated appendix which of the following scores would be used to assess surgical mortality now in a patient with cirrhosis or any liver problem wherever we are doing surgery there is a risk of mortality and that risk of mortality worsens or increases if you know the liver function further deteriorates which is why we use the child pug turcot score right to see what is the prognosis post surgery in a patient who has cirrhosis the meld score is the model for end stage liver disease score that can also be used in adults but for your exam if you have to choose you will mark child pug score in this patient you need to memorize the child book score this has been asked many times it includes encephalopathy ascites bilirubin albumin and prothrombin time and each parameter is ranged from 1 to 3 and if the score is 5 to 6 it is least severe cirrhosis or least severe liver dysfunction b is moderately severe and c is most severe liver dysfunction so the mortality will also be very high even if you are doing a non liver procedure this is the meld score the meld score includes the serum bilirubin inr and creatinine and those who are preparing for the inicet exam all these scores are very important for you because they are frequently asked in the exam so you need to remember the child book score and the meld score as well This is the PEL score, the Pediatric End Liver Disease score, which includes albumin, bilirubin, INR, growth failure, and age. A patient admitted for routine checkup on CT. The following finding was seen on CT. What is the most probable diagnosis? This you can see the classical lesion in the liver, which is showing a central stellate scar. and this central ciliate scar is seen in focal nodular hyperplasia and this central ciliate scar is nothing but the arteriole which is radiating outwards now these patients of fnh are usually asymptomatic and you don't need to do anything you just need to keep these keep these patients under observation so this is focal nodular hyperplasia focal nodular hyperplasia is a benign condition there is decreased blood supply which is one of the etiologies and you can see kupffer cells which is why it shines on a sulfur colloid scan but the classical finding is a central ciliate scar and we usually conservatively manage these focal nodular hyperplasias so this question is the one which most of the students got wrong and they found tricky now this is particularly relevant for the pg exams not for the mci exams according to the strasberg classification of bile duct injury injury to the right aberrant posterior sectoral duct with obstructed duct is what type of injury so the correct answer here is type b strasberg is the correct answer which we can evaluate using an mrcp not an ercp ercp is invasive where you need to cannulate the papilla here mrcp magnetic resonance is non right it is not invasive you are not doing a procedure so the complications are less right so this is the bismuth and the strasberg classification again this is only been asked once in the inicet exam otherwise it is not been asked now small leaks from the cystic duct are strasberg a occlusion of an aberrant right hepatic duct is b which is what was mentioned in the question stem leak from an aberrant right hypocon hy duct is type c lateral injury to cbd is d and then you have 1 to 5 or e1 to e5 both of them mean the same thing now i want to discuss some questions which are other than what i had given in the quiz as well because from the hepatobiliary system one of the favorite questions which the examiner asks is what is going to be the next investigation and students are often confused between mrcp and ercp so that is the confusion which i want to sort out here so you have a 56 year old 
patient with surgically obstructed jaundice right so surgically obstructed jaundice would mean that there the direct bilirubin is raised alp is raised in these patients and here you have a distended gallbladder with dilated cbd and intrahepatic biliary radicals as well right so basically what this means is that the intrahepatic radicals are dilated gallbladder is dilated cbd is dilated now when will this happen this will happen when something is blocking the opening of the cbd and the pancreatic duct so probably a cancer in the head of the pancreas or any of the periampullary cancers now to evaluate these periampullary cancers or to see them better i would want to do an imaging and i would want to do an imaging which is non invasive so here i would like to do mrcp magnetic resonance cholangio pancreaticography this you can see is an mrcp and how do we first thing differentiate between mrcp film and ercp film this is mrcp this is ercp endoscopic retrograde cholangio pancreaticography and in an ercp film you will always see the endoscope whereas in an mrcp film you will never see the endoscope so that is how we differentiate and when we do an mrcp in such a situation you can get a double duct sign in such a patient so this was one question this is another very common question which is asked a patient underwent a lap coli in the post operative period the patient develops fever and tachycardia the wbc count is raised ultrasound shows a 5 into 5 cm collection in the right hypochondrium right so the patient had a lap coli and now the patient has developed fever and tachycardia and tlc is also raised all these are suggestive of a leak right an injury to the bile duct and there is a leak and that is confirmed on an ultrasound that there is a collection there now i want to see what is the nature of the leak where is it leaking from right which vessel or which duct has been injured and then i have to take action right so before i do that in such a patient who is already symptomatic i first need to control the symptoms so in such a patient the first thing which i will do is ultrasound guided pig tail catheter drainage to drain out the collection second in this patient right we will do an mrcp to look for the leak where is the injury and then we can do an ercp in this patient and we can put a stent across the leak the ercp can be both diagnostic and therapeutic because you can use it for stenting you can use it for retrieval of stones but first we will confirm by mrcp now this is another situation a patient with multiple gallstones undergoes an ultrasound right so the patient has gallstones has undergone an ultrasound which reveals the cbd diameter to be 12 mm and serum bilirubin is 0.8 alp is raised it is 380 and ggt is five times raised so now we have a patient who has cbd diameter is increase so cbd diameter more than 10 mm we uh, the alarm bell start ringing that there might be a stone in the cbd which might have dropped from the gallbladder now how do we confirm this so ultrasound is not a good modality to look at the cbd right because the lower half of the cbd you cannot see so here again first i just want to confirm whether there are stones or not and to do that what will you do ercp or mrcp i told you mrcp is non invasive so we will start with magnetic resonance cholangio pancreaticography and that is what will show us stones in the cbd and then i can do an ercp to retrieve those stones right so always remember this this is a ready reckoner which i have prepared which will help you in answering questions the investigation of choice for gall stones and for cholecystitis both right even for cholecystitis 
the investigation of choice is ultrasound the investigation of choice for cbd stones i just told you common bile duct stones is mrcp but if you have very small cbd stones which are known as cbd microliths you can do an endoscopic ultrasound the gold standard investigation would be ERCP because it is therapeutic as well but because it is invasive we usually do MRCP first. The investigation of choice for CBD strictures is MRCP. Small bile leakage after cholecystectomy if there is bile in the drain patient is stable if there is very minor leak you monitor but like I showed you in one of the scenarios if the patient is symptomatic that means fever, jaundice, tachycardia, then you will put in an ultrasound guided pigtail, then we do MRCP and then ERCP and stenting. So that is how we manage this and this is just a summary of the investigations which is asked quite frequently. So this was the discussion of the second test, the third test was on trauma and burns which I will be discussing and posting on Saturday. The questions were already there on my telegram channel. I posted the solution as well but the discussion I'll post by this Saturday and for this week the quiz topic is vascular surgery and you can see these on my telegram channel. The link is mentioned here. If you have any questions please do write them in the comment section. I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you.